Um, so my name is Matt Whelan, um, and the talk's called a uh, bit of a tongue-in-cheek, we don't know nothing, storyboarding in VR. Um, and that's to say, kind of, we do know some things. Um, the, uh, I have a company, small company, called GoodThink, and we make animated commercials. Um, so we do uh, these little, for the past two years, we've been doing these margarine commercials to stay afloat. Um, but they've, they've aired kind of around the world. And uh, because we've done so much animation, we kind of uh, got to thinking about a year ago about VR a year and a half ago maybe, and saying, could we move some of this stuff into this space? Because I'm really excited about it. I hope everybody here is really excited about it. Um, and uh, so we have all this animated work. What would it take to move something across into VR? So the first thing we did was we, um, we just did 360 stereo renders um, to see how that would work with, a, um, with an ad. So you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with this kind of lat-long way of rendering things. And it was okay uh, in terms of immersion and being able to watch an ad. But the problem was kind of evident that 360 stereo video uh, lacked parallax. And if everybody understands what I'm talking about, I heard somebody mention it earlier. So this might be a contentious issue. But 360 video, when, as soon as you lean one way or another, breaks, just like when you're at a stereo movie. And um, the real power of VR, I think, in terms of co-opting our sense, senses, is that uh, you, can, you can look around something, you can get parallax. So the main reason this happens, obviously, is because your head doesn't rotate from your eyes, it rotates from your neck. So anytime you turn your head, although in theory the parallax should be so minimal that it shouldn't matter, it does matter because the things in the foreground very minorly should move more than the things in the background. So we end up with a rotation center offset problem. And for me personally, I get quite nauseous watching 360 video. Um, there's nothing against it. And I just want to say very quickly that anybody moving forward in the space of VR, I'm super excited that you're doing it. So I'm not trying to detract from you. Uh, but uh, we have these great directors like Doug Lyman and the people working at Within who put together, I don't know if anybody's seen these shows, but Invisible was the first series. Um, and it's an eight minute thing that I couldn't get all the way through due to nausea. And I don't think I'm particularly um, uh, prone to it. So in VR, we have this problem where we have a continuum. At, at one side, you get ill. And at the other side, you get really immersed in something. And the idea behind storyboarding in VR, which I'll get to in a second, is that we want to just move you along the continuum. We want to move you away from being ill and towards being happy. Um, and just to finish talking about live action, Microsoft and 8i, I think they're called, are doing some great work with volumetric capture. And I think this is where everything's going to end up. So don't despair if for right now we're languishing a little bit. So uh, here's a 30 second spot. Uh, the next thing we did after we rendered out that 360 uh, stereo video and I was unhappy was uh, we said, well, let's take a traditional commercial and just move it completely across, but let's try to do it properly, or let's at least try to prototype it. So we asked what steps would be involved in porting a television commercial, uh, which I'm going to show you now, across to VR. So this is the finished spots on the left. Yeah, your left. And the uh, boards are on the right. So this is what, the, uh, this is what we would typically deliver. And sorry for the audio, but it'll help you, uh, it'll help you track. Oh, look! A hungry dinosaur! Mom, dinosaurs only eat meat. Actually, the biggest dinosaurs only ate plants. And did you know Country Croc is made with plants? Country Croc has always been made with the goodness of plants. It has real, simple ingredients and the same I delicious, love. tasty love. <gasps> Real country fresh taste made with the goodness of plants. Welcome to Croc Country. Uh, this, so what we did was then we, it would cost a lot of money to re rig and anybody who's familiar with animation to do all the things to move it over to um, an engine in, inside a video game engine. They have Alembic support and those types of things, but they're languishing a little bit because of the frame rates. Uh, as soon as you start pulling in Alembics of significant size, you drop down to 45 frames a second, and again, we move in the continuum in the wrong direction. So in an effort to try to move in the right direction, we said, well, what if we just storyboard this out? What if we just make an animatic? So like the thing we just watched on the right-hand side, 
um, which we take to be quite extensive when we do commercials, television commercials, can we make an extensive animatic in, in VR? So this is what came out of that. Whoa! Oh look, a hungry dinosaur. Mom, dinosaurs only eat meat. Actually, the biggest dinosaurs only ate plants. And did you know Country Croc is made with plants? Country Croc has always been made with the goodness of plants. It has real, simple ingredients and the same I delicious, love tasty love. love. <gasps> real, country-fresh taste made with the goodness of plants. Welcome so, to Croc Country. So, um, I would be the first to say that this isn't necessarily the best written commercial. Uh, and it's potentially, definitely not the best written commercial for VR. But in order to, whenever I talk to companies about advertising, agencies about uh, uh, advertising in VR, they say, well, what do you mean? And I think that what, you needed, what we needed to do was make a one-to-one -one correlation between what people knew and what we're trying to get people to understand. So uh, this, uh, this was kind of our attempt at doing that. And, and through the process of doing this, I think we learned a lot as well. And I just want to talk about that. And to bring it back uh, to the point of the talk, which is that we, I think, know some things about how to make films in VR, about how to tell narratives. So porting TV to VR, obviously, we had to restage the action. So the big thing is, is that we've gone manic with cuts, I think, in television and movies. Uh, so there's uh, 16 shots in the commercial in the 30 seconds. So that's a shot every two seconds, roughly, for those of you who are good at math. Um, and to move it to VR, we reduced that to four, so by about a quarter. Um, not a margarine fan. Uh, this, <laughs> so, uh, and, and of course, this is something you have to do. You have to, I, I think if we cut at this kind of pace, in VR, we would be moving again in the wrong direction along that continuum. So, uh, so we moved it down to four, and it's contentious to even say you can cut in VR. You'll get people who will tell you that that'll break your immersion, and that they're, uh, that's not the thing to do in this medium. Um, I, I disagree with that. I think that cutting is necessary for anything narrative, because you, you need to move through temporally. We need to move through time. And we need to move uh, spatially to other locations. We need to do those things. So we have to solve this. Somehow or another, we have to figure out how we can't just be in one space all the time for every experience that we go into. Um, and so we took the soft approach where we fade to black and fade back up um, in order to try to make that as not nauseous as possible. And I think that one of the things I'm excited about, outside of JLo's uh, rock and bod here, is the idea that we may have gone too far with cuts in TV and movies. And I won't mention any movies, but maybe they did. maybe they forgot about story, forgotten about story, uh, a little much because they know that they can just blow things up and cut to the next shot, and that'll release dopamine, and the audience will say, "Yeah, it wasn't so bad." So they're potentially in VR. I'm one of the people who I think is excited about the idea that we can get back to not cutting all the time, and maybe being thoughtful about all the cuts that we're going to do. Anyway, so um, good thing my company uh, came up with this kind of process, this workflow called Story VR. And the idea is that we're going to go, in order to move along the continuum in the right direction, we're going to go from, uh, from script to screen uh, with as many iterations as possible in order to try to solve this problem, to move us towards the happy place. So it's kind of using uh, a, a common sense approach. And the best way to discover, uh, yeah, I just said that. We're all good. OK, so uh, what, what does it mean? Well, we had to port the set over, obviously. And we did quite a big deal with the set because we had it in animation anyways. We had all the textures. So we, we moved it over fully. It took you know, a week of time. But, and we had to restage the commercial, as I already talked about, with the four shots instead of um, 16. Uh, and we had to board, learn a new way to board but it wasn't that bad. It was uh, surprisingly familiar. We just had to go a little bit more orthographic. So for any of you who draw in this room or who do have done storyboards, uh, it just means you're dealing with things from head to toe and making it a little flatter. And when you, uh, well. So then, uh, so redraw the boards, edit in your favorite NLE. So nonlinear editor, the idea here is that we're allowing storyboard artists to continue to work in the, um, 
in the programs to which they are accustomed. Um, and when I say we programmed, I didn't program much of it. Uh, Io Burgess and Rob Dolores are two really smart guys who, if you ever need some help, go talk to them. Um, so NLE is a nonlinear editor, whether it's Final Cut Pro or in here Premiere Pro. You can edit out your drawings. You can watch your story. You can know what you're making. Um, and then we just push it over to, in this case, Unreal Engine Sequencer, but there's no reason it couldn't be Unity's director or any other software that gets you into a video game uh, style environment, an engine environment, um, or Google Spotlight maybe, which will be available soon, I think. Um, so this is what that looks like in terms of the workflow. So cut everything inside, um, this is set up minorly, uh, cut everything inside your nonlinear editor, Push out an XML in terms of how to get your timeline, where your edits were, and which shots you're using, or which drawings you're using. And then it'll come in on a card inside the R. And then you just set transforms and push those cards around in order to act, set out your timing and your acting for the show. So you can imagine then being in your first person situation where you're the viewer as you get these things out, and your actors are performing around you in a way that uh, is a very quick pro prototype. And this took about two hours. Um, the whole process to move something from a television commercial into VR uh, took about two days to do the redrawing uh, situation. So it's 30 seconds, it's not very long. Um, and about a week to do the, the set itself. But you can imagine a huge economy in, in being able to prototype at this type of pace in comparison to having to make rigs, to animate, to do all these what traditionally would be called layout, in order to find out whether your show is working or not. So I'd like to think we don't know nothing. And the, the core of the talk is to say that while it's very true that there is not yet, as in film, an established language in VR, much of the lexicon can be borrowed from over a century of filmmaking. So as long as we're iterating, let's go try the things that we think tell stories do them in VR, see if they work, do they move you on the continuum towards being sick or happy, and then let's establish the language of VR and call that the language of VR. So um, comparing visual language, I'm a little behind here, so I'm going to have to rush through this. But the question is, what do we lose when telling stories in VR? What do we gain and what translates? So we have a huge amount of, uh, of films now to look at in VR. How many people here own a Vive or a Rift? How many have access to one? Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, many of you, or most of you, have probably seen at least some of these. And uh, one of the things that excites me, my background being in animation, is that animation seems to be leading the way in this field. Um, just like in stereoscopic uh, movies, the Pixar really kind of set up with, I think it was Up. It was one of the ones I cried at. Um, they set up the idea that you want to stay in positive space, you want to stay behind the picture plane. Before that, there was a lot of people throwing yo-yos in your face and stuff in, stereo in stereoscopy. And I think the same thing's going to be true in, in VR, or seems to be already being true in VR. Um, so four things we potentially lose, and some of these are contentious, but camera moves, uh, shot composition, third-person perspective, and cuts or depth of field. Um, I, I already harped on this a little bit, so I don't want to come down too hard on these two uh, experiences. But I was nauseous while viewing them, mostly because of the camera moves, and that's an inner ear fluid problem. So, you know, people will tell you, like, if you nod your head or bounce your body, it helps to alleviate that, but uh, it's not the way I prefer to watch movies, Bounce, bouncing. Um, and Pearl. Uh, again, just talking about animation, found a really good way to move around the scene. They, they put you in a car. And it seems like that frame was enough to offset the nausea. Um, and uh, uh, I think that this is just a really good example of iteratively trying things out and that leading to an answer that may not be intuitive. Um, one could imagine an Iron Man-like suit or something being enough to hold you, or binoculars, or whatever it is, to hold you into the frame um, in a few variations. That's, that's my bad version of that. But you can see that at least there's a way out of that problem. Um, shot composition. So control over the camera. The viewer can look any direction intentionally ignoring the story. This is something I hear all the time from people when we talk about telling narratives in VR and they say, but how do you control the person where they're going to look? They could look anywhere they want. 
And uh, let me just, yeah, crazy, flying by. Let me just uh, tell you a scenario. The, uh, imagine you and your friend go out, uh, go into a dark room, sit beside each other facing the same direction, and don't talk for two to three hours. It'd be considered very strange social behavior, but it's something thousands of people do all the time. And they do it in pursuit of stories. So to think that VR is going to be any different, I think is pretty naive. The idea that you're going to buy a story, put on a headset, and then be like, nope, not going to watch that. I'll be over here. It doesn't make a ton of sense. You could look at the floor in the theater or behind you, but you don't. You look at the thing that you want to look at. That's why you're there. So um, thank you, front row. Um, so we will have to lead this, the viewer with staging as we do in film, and we're going to have to lead them with audio cues, Resident Evil, I think it was seven, some number that's way too high. Uh, did a really good job of that with, with having a sound when you turn around. Um, and Robo Recall, if you guys have played that game by the Oculus Studio, just stridently would draw arrows to tell you to turn back around. Um, and that might be a little bit overt, but these are all ways that we're trying in order to try to get to you to, to face in the right direction. Um, there's a play called uh, Sleep No More from Kitcher Hotel in New York, and if anybody has a chance to get out to see it, it's been playing for five or six years, I suggest you do it. You're literally running around a four-story building in uh, the meatpacking district, trying to figure out what the hell is going on, and you're the audience in those masks, and the actors are just performing, and they're on a loop. Uh, it's a really neat experience, and I think it kind of feeds into our predatory desire to follow things uh, and see if we can catch the story. And uh, this might be something that translates into VR. There's no other point to that except that I thought that was a really cool show. Um, so you're locked into the first-person perspective, and this limits how we can depict stories. There's no more sexy CG shots for David Fincher. Um, this makes it more akin to a stage play. Again, I think... You can lament it, or you can say, we have some examples. We, we know some things about stage plays and how to stage things, lighting cues. And these are the things that you can draw upon in order to move forward in this medium. No cuts or depth of field. So um, I'd fight the conventional wisdom on the cuts, which I already explained. And the quick question is, what do we gain in VR? Well, we can deliver emotion, more emotional impact, and obviously that's tendentious, it's self-serving of me for, to want to say that you get more emotion out of VR, because I want it to be more emotional. Um, but I don't think it's unfounded. So film co-ops your sight and your, your hearing. And uh, VR co-ops your spatial awareness. So three major senses that we use to evolve on the savannah uh, in order to not be eaten and enable, to be eat, uh, enable us to eat are being uh, co-opted in order to tell you these stories. And I good think our kind of catchphrase, which is a little bit ridiculous, but also might be somewhat true, and it sells well to the advertisers, is in film, you watch stories, and in VR, you make memories. And I think all of us have felt some of that in our, the experiences that we've gone into. I remember that big whale, and I remember the, uh, the little gnome guy finally being my friend after I figured out what the point to the game was. <laughs> John Favreau. Um, so what translates? And unfortunately, I'm really out of time, so I'm going to go through these super quick. But things like blocking, um, so people walking into the foreground and being larger than the people in the background, that's something Kubrick uses here in, uh, in uh, uh, Dr. Strangelove, and I'll see if I can fast forward. But you can see people, uh, the Russians talking about the bomb, and he walks into the foreground and he gets big because he's winning the fight. And then our defense minister walks up and they fight, and now they're on the same level. And then he says, but you haven't heard the story of G, and he walks into the foreground, and the whole world's going to be destroyed. And then the president comes and joins, and they have a discussion, and by the end of it, our minister of defense falls down, and he's obviously the person who lost the fight. It's comedy, people. It's okay. Um, but the, uh, the, the ability to just one-to-one -one staging and blocking make people bigger and smaller as they come towards you and away from you is one way to uh, translate what we already know in film into VR. Repetition, Pan's Labyrinth. Anybody see this film? So uh, we got two evil characters at the head of an opulent table in front of a fireplace. They happen at different points in the film, but, uh, but you connect those two characters. Those are what <laughs> bad people do as they sit at the top of these things. Um, there's a really good talk by Mike Hill that goes into more of this stuff, uh, gives examples from Terminator 2, 
You should watch that. Uh, hopefully, that got grabbed on the. You should grab that on the video real quick. You got that? Love it. Um, so go look that up. He's great. Um, and so all these things do translate uh, into VR, and we should get testing them because uh, we we know some things. Uh, lastly, I just want to point out uh, I'm in touch with Tavori, with Dimitri and Victor, and they're making a great program. I don't know if anybody's seen this, but this is a prototyping program that allows you to take a rag doll and walk it around, and you can actually record um, your movements inside VR. So you can pick up two dolls and make them like talk to each other, and then move over here, and then play that back. And uh, it's the same type of prototyping thing, and then shrink yourself down and be right with them as they do that performance. So I think I'm getting kicked off. But bottom line is thanks, and email me uh, if you would like to talk any more about this. Cheers.